Uh, I would uh, I would like to uh, invite uh, Ken, who really I would like to thank Ken. I'd like to thank also Anne Belanger, who's uh, staff with the with the with the Prospective Developer Association of Canada, and we also have uh, Nadine Cara here. Hi, Nadine, who is the uh, who is the senior program manager, and uh, and he's been uh, he's been important for a lot of the stuff that we've been doing in the, in the Geoscience Committee, and uh, and also. Uh, has been very supportive of a lot, all, all of the stuff we've been doing with DMIC. So, so without any further delay, here you go, Ken. Thanks, Charles. Everybody, welcome. Good morning. First DDAC event for some, hopefully. Um, so, why the matrix? Um, the question. Um, Craig Hart actually said, well, you should tell us what the question is. And I'm thinking, Craig, you have to tell us what the question is. Uh, and the question, of course, usually leads to an answer, which often leads to another question. But in the exploration world, and I, I, we're going to focus, I think, because of our backgrounds, pretty much on the exploration side. Um, within the mining world, we're, I think we're, we're, as an industry, at a cusp. There's a whole bunch of things that are happening. In terms of technology, we have available technologies that are either developed inside by our, by our, our subcontractors that we're having difficulties figuring out how to use. And I think going forward, unless we get a better grasp on this, uh, we're going to be, as an industry, continuing to struggle. And it's not, adversity isn't a bad thing. I think it's how you respond to it. It's, it's the, it's a, I happen to be a still, a rollerblader. And people say, well, is it hard to stand up? And I said, standing up is not the problem. He said, I said, getting up after you fall is the issue. That's the, that's the hard part. Do you have the, the gumption to do that? And, and in our industry, after you know, the last four or six years of, uh, of pretty tough times, a lot of us are asking that question. You know, what do we actually do when we get back up? How are we going to conduct ourselves? So in the matrix, the red pill, if you don't remember, that was basically exit. That basically puts you into a world that is, uh, call it the hard reality, uh, things that you, you no longer have the juicy steak that the, their turncoat went, basically went back into the matrix to enjoy. The blue pill basically allows you to continue doing what you're doing. In a lot of cases, I think we have things that we're very comfortable with. We've been doing them for a long period of time. Uh, but we're starting to question, are we achieving the results from those activities that we expect we need going forward. And one of the things which, unfortunately, we haven't been able to tie in enormously in, in this particular venue, uh, we actually have one student, is what I describe, for people of my generation, we're building the boats, but we're not the ones sailing them. It's basically our ideas that are, are going into the research organizations, going into the planning, five-year, ten-year cycles, but it's the younger people that actually are going to have to, uh, like in the, you know, the animation Moana, it's the young people that basically are going to be piloting the boats. Uh, so I think we have to get it right. We've got an obligation to think about some of these things and, you know, what, who we're actually doing this for. So I guess in terms of the, the issue, I, I thought this, the, you know, the three eyes, you always got to come up with something that, to invent. And invention is still relevant. We don't have probably as much of that within our business as some others. For a period of eight years, uh, the company I work for, a mining company, was owned by General Electric. They had nine Nobel laureates on retainer and staff. In the early 80s, they were spending $2 billion a year on primary research. It was amazing to see how people that actually worked with research as a business and got things out into the marketplace. How they, and it, not everything had to be a success, but invention can still be extremely important. And if we can identify and support people doing that, I think that's good. Innovation, that is, that is becoming the, the ox that's having to pull many carts these days. We all talk about innovation as basically being, well, if you're not innovating, you're not really with it, right? But you look around a room and you say, well, how are you actually innovating? How did you plan in your last business cycle to actually implement and very importantly audit the innovations that you're doing within your organization? 
And the back end of it, as we were talking with a couple of people this morning, we are terrible at auditing. We do not do postmortems. We do not look at, because we all think it's a blame game. Somehow we're so interconnected with the activities that we're doing, we can't separate our, our own personas from the success or failure of the work we do. And so I think in part we're, we're, we, we miss the point of we need to look at why we're, when we've been successful and when we haven't been. And we have to be faster. I had a, a little sidebar chat with, with Dave about this, and just one of the things is we have to speed up what we do in our business. And it's not just speed, it's the quality of work that we can pass information of a high fidelity, a high confidence, on to the next party. And this is one of the things that James Cleverly will be talking a bit about, this, this tube drill. And his, his piece, which is probably, to me the tube drilling is, is, is like another rocket. The important thing is what you do with the rocket. And his lab at the rig, or what it's been transformed now, we're going to be generating terabytes of data at the drill rig. The question is, and he's, he's put a few of these comments, he and his uh, colleague Michelle, are going to be in the SEG newsletter in April, about what do we do with all this information? We are not prepared. We are not prepared as an industry to cope with terabytes of data coming out of the drill rig that have to have a decision made about them within 24 or 48 hours, not six months later, not after the assessment report's filed. So we have technologies now that are challenging us at all these levels. And in, I, I forget, I apologize, whoever sent this to me. But this guy, you got, I gotta give him a hug when I see him, this Monroe, he's a, he's a metallurgist. You read their document, and it's got some of the exact same issues that we have in expiration. Too much data being thro thrown at them, not the right things. Uh, I like that, that third one. I actually know some people that do geometallurgy, and I thought it was really great. But it's become a catch-all, maybe. Anyways, this is, was given at a uh, meeting in Australia just last year. And he had done an earlier one in 2009, and he says, that's why he said, back to the future still on the dark side, still hasn't improved. Did you circulate this to everybody? I think I did. I, I received it, I, went right. there, I thought it was very, very good. Yeah, I apologize, it was a little bit, uh, when I scanned it, he, the, 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 somebody had highlighted it yellow and it became a very faint, but anyways, and then that, that's from his PowerPoint, which is on the web. So, we all have to draw from the well that Richard Shoddy kindly puts in front of us, that there's only one bucket of data, largely, some rich companies can afford the SNL stuff, but they're becoming increasingly stingy. Uh, I, you know, they're just not releasing their information quite as well. And that's one thing we've become very conscious of news and information in, in the U.S. And, and, you know, having Richard is great, but only having one person who generates this sort of information is a bit of a concern. Because I've had a chance, Richard's not a, he's a great guy, but he's not a geoscientist. And I know he's done some things with some of the data sets he's looked at that aren't exactly, they're not wrong, but there's a bias to them that it actually is, is very much a non-specialist bias. And, um, but anyways, he does, what, um, he does what he does and he's the only one and you know, God bless him. So, but in a way, some years ago when I worked in BHP in San Francisco, one of our secretaries, put uh, uh, the London Medical, uh, Metals Exchange tracking the gold price up on the wall. And we're an expiration group. And I think we thought that was cute for about a week. And then somebody said, Sheila, why have you put that up there? What has that got to do with my life? If it goes down, do I sit in my room with the lights off, depressed? You know, some of these things are really just a backdrop that's just happening. And a large part of this, of course, is the past. It goes back to 1975. I just was coming into the business around then. So what is that, you know? Is it good or bad? There's cycles. Do we understand what the cycles mean? At a certain level, I think we do. Sorry, Ken, sorry to interrupt. I just want to flag this at this point here that PDC's been trying for three years to work with the federal and provincial governments to come up with a consistent definition of discovery. Uh, so that we can actually generate a Canadian database so we're not dependent on Shadi. So if you're interested in that project, come and talk to me after. Okay. Good point. So, 
it's just getting harder. Discovery costs are rising. Um, and I think, in a way, it's audited costs. But you all know in a lot of projects, there's a huge amount of money that's been spent historically, which just gets written off. Investors, companies have been all burned, sometimes going 20 years or more back. So that's one of the things I think that, and I mentioned about increasing the time, the speed at which we go through things. And that maybe is a sub-issue, a far more addressable problem than in, say, improving expiration effectiveness. And I separate effectiveness from efficiency, and that's, that to me, the, the, the one E, a lot of time is spent on efficiency. That's not the same as effectiveness. Never is. Effectiveness is actually doing what you need to do. Efficiency is putting some budget back to your lords and masters, which probably is, they're not really expecting. This did come out of SNL's press release. I assume they're going to do a PDAC thing. They seem to still do that. And boy, I mean, if that was a ski slope, I was really impressed. We were basically in four years able to go up, <laughs> had a 200% increase, and we came down at the same. But again, to me, it's not the problem. It's, not, it's just a part of the phenomena of our industry. Large part of it is willingness of investors to, to put money into the business. <clears throat> Large companies sort of go in a way, I mean, if you, if you were uh, uh, sitting in your helicopter or spaceship and you looked at that, you would think somebody was controlling it. That there was some, you know, um, Mike Myers sort of character out there doing this because it looks like there's just the pattern, but it's just, you know, in a way it's a whole thousands of semi random events. But I liked his box at the end. This was actually given, PDC, I think, contracted this for 2015. And challenge of increasing depth. It's a slow burning issue, and I think I think I think Richard got it right there. We're not going to be mugged about this tonight or tomorrow. It's it's simply coming, and it, it's hitting the more mature trains sooner. When you look at the statistics and the you know the full presentation, these are all available. You can just see things you know uh, in Australia, in Canada, in the U.S. We're having to look deeper. So, but in West Africa, you take if you take wits out of the African equation, West Africa. You can almost kick dirt away and find a deposit. That's just, that's just the nature of exploration. But I like this middle part, and I've highlighted it there. Develop new search concepts and technologies. This I borrowed from, from Cam. Um, he actually gave a presentation, he's given a series of presentations here at the, the PDAC. But this, to me, is one of those you can spend a great deal of time and almost get lost in a diagram like this. But basically, where we look becomes more and more important as opposed to how we look. On the how part, we're really good. That's on the right side. When it comes to actually pulling apart a package of ground with, with geology, geochemistry, geophysics, drilling, we're extremely good at it. How we, what we actually do with that information going on is, is a slightly different question. But in terms of the conceptual side, that broad regional, where do you go to look? This becomes probably one of those key questions that we need to think about. And part of what I see as having spent a large part of my life as a geophysicist, that issue requires the much greater interaction between geophysics and geology. Because the information that's going to be used at the terrain scales is typically some sort of geophysical slash whether available geochemical data that I call radiometrics geochemistry. We're not very good at that part. So what happens? New concepts. How do we develop new concepts if we don't embrace the data that's going to tell us about what's undergoing in the crust of the Earth. This is a, a model I presented in its full glory. Uh, John Horonsky, who's part of the, the cabal in uh, the CET, very bright guy. I call him Spock without the ears. 
asked me to put this together for the Keystone 2014 SCG meeting. <clears throat> and his question was, he says, tell me what the geophysical signatures are or mineral systems. And honest to God, I, had, there was, I didn't know what to say. I mean, I didn't know where to turn or who, you know, what do you actually, how do you, how do you put an answer to something like that? So I hijacked one of uh, Cam's illustrations, and that's the underlying bit, where you have an inflow, some sort of pathway, fluids, you have a, a, a deep pool point where an ore body drops out, and then you have some sort of flushing or spent uh, uh, fluids, but no, largely the metals have been removed. And these scales that I put on, I mean, I, I bit, the, the old, well, term I was introduced to when I was managing software development was, it's a puma. You know, heard of a puma? It's Australian. Pulled out of my ass. I had no idea whether they were right or wrong. Ten kilometers, question mark. But these are the things that if you say, okay, if that's to happen to the earth, and you drop it down, and you say, what's the magnetic expression? What's the conductivity expression? What's the density? Can we see these things? Can we begin building models? Some idea of, you know, weak. I mean, people love, you know, who don't know about the actual challenges of exploration. They talk about large, weak anomalies. Well, to me, that has the same curse as a large, low tonnage gold deposit. They're great for a paper, but they suck when you try and make any money out of them, right? Just, they're, they're unpredictable in terms of cost. So, I know um, James Austin, who hopefully will be here. I don't know. I might have, uh, hey, there he is, all right. You don't have the leather coat. Anyways, James and some of his colleagues at CSIRO have been working on this. I'd love to see more done about it, but this is where it can't just be a geophysical run. Geologists have to take ownership of this. Right now, the only blending of geology and geophysics is a stolen kind of a, of a, a theoretical geologist idea, and I've dropped some geophysical concepts down on top of it. It's not a working model, but it's sort of like I need to present something at this meeting. <coughs> Here, we're good. We're getting costs down, we can detect things, um, but you lose flexibility in prediction. So you end up, you really just have what you have. And I, I liken this to one of our great institutions in the US, the SWAT team. Once the SWAT team is called in, it doesn't matter whether it's the little old lady crocheting or the meth heads. They're going through that door and everybody's gonna be on the floor with handcuffs in 10 seconds, it doesn't matter. That to me is what geophysics really largely has become. You turn, you turn a VTEM system loose and bang, you've got conductors or sky tip. Bang, bang, bang. And we can Maxwell model those to blue in the face. It's all good. We just don't have a freaking clue what the targets are most of the time. So we're very good at it. We've got to get better. We've got to take ownership of the left hand side of that curve got to get the geology and geophysics working together. And God bless them, I, I've been trying to get people at the Econ Geology to think a bit more about this. I've had some help from John recently. We've got together, we call the Dyslexic Mentor piece. We've got our third column, James has written, his uh, colleague Michelle. We're trying to get geologists to think about technology in ways that they haven't before. And it has to be you look at economic geology, it's a wonderful journal, but do we need the 387th paper on fluid inclusions of a porphyry in Ecuador? Is that going to make us any better at finding the next one? This, this is the day when guys still wore ties, right? Still wore ties. The day with the history lesson, the guy on the left is Colin Reeves. The guy on the right, Fraser Grant. She died that year. Fraser tried to bridge the gap between geology and geophysics looking at magnetite. He had two seminal papers that came out posthumously, and uh, it was a start, but then nobody continued with it, unfortunately. So, just saw this last week, and I'm thinking, and unfortunately one of the things, and I, I won't exclude you, Anne, but we only had one woman from a mining company who was signed up to attend. And I think part of our problem is our dialogues are so 
controlling of how we think about things when only one gender basically has control of that dialogue. That's one thing when I looked at that. I, got, I told a, a colleague at the office, I got to watch the last 15 minutes of this show at least one more time because I did not freaking understand what she was doing. But she clearly, the concept that language can control how we think is important. When I, when I look at the Northern Miner, you know, I had my last break, they had a picture of a guy down in, uh, I think it was, again, it was in Ecuador. He was in some glory hole. Uh, it was a good company. I mean, it was a solid company. The guy was sitting there with a, with a jackhammer in rubber boots, no helmet, no eye protection, no ear protection. So I sent, um, it's Keebles, grandson, he's a writer for the miner. I said, this is one of the problems we've got in this business. We don't think about who's looking at these freaking pictures. This is, this is 19th century shit you're showing us. So to me, whether it's visual or in text, we're trapped somewhat in our paradigm of how we look at things. And I think we've got to get, innovation has to come through people as well as ideas. And I think we, we have to really push diversity. And I sent that back to Sally, which just that she was, she says, I'm really sorry I can't make it today. So anyways, I probably run over my time, but uh, there we go. Thank you.